the in interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University. Mr. Bleacher, can you start by telling us a little bit about your background? For instance, where were you born? Uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, okay. January 23, 1926. All right, and what did your family do? Or what kind of uh, situation were you born in? My family had one of these little, today it would be one of these convenience stores mm -hmm. with a gas station, and uh, my mother and dad, and he had a job at the post office. Mm -hmm. When I was two years old, he got fired for shooting off his mouth, and anyway, mm -hmm. he took off. So uh, my mother went back to New York City with me and my older sister. Uh, was she from there originally? Or? No, no. My mother was from New York City. Is where yeah. She was yeah. raised as a child. So she went to be and my sister and went back to New York City with us. Okay. And then did she get a job there? Or? Yeah, she got a job at the dry cleaning store. She met a gentleman there uh, who was younger than she. And they had it work together and then they left and started their own little business right mm -hmm. in the middle of the Depression. And how well did that go? Uh, they made it, but it was nip and tuck every month. Uh, mm -hmm. Things were so bad. Now, what was it like uh, living in New York at that point? Well, it's always a congested city. And, you know, I didn't know any different because mm -hmm. when I left Iowa and went across the country, mm -hmm. I really don't remember that. Sure. Because I was an infant. Right. And we stopped with a sister in Flint, and then we went on. And okay. Now, did you uh, finish high school there? Yes, I did. I went to high school at Erasmus Hall High School. Uh, it was originally a Dutch, uh, with a, there's a Dutch Reformed church across from mm -hmm. it, and it was a parochial school with Desiderius Erasmus, who would be familiar with right. the name. He did Latin things. He had a falling out with the Pope and had a falling mm -hmm. out with Martin Luther, and there's a big statue of him with a book there. Mm -hmm. We'd throw pennies up, but if you got penny in the first shot, you were going to pass the exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I studied Latin for three years, Spanish for two years, physics, chemistry, Algebra, basic algebra, basic geometry, never went that far in math. Mm -hmm. I had the capacity, but I was busy with language. And I started choral work there and when I was 14. And I graduated at 16 because they started me early. I was mm -hmm. too young emotionally, but old enough intellectually to get through with it. Mm -hmm. And I had moderately good grades, not very good, and not too bad. Never failed anything. All right. Now, how did you wind up in the Merchant Marine? Well, when I was a boy, I went to a curry thing and get, fell in love with horses. I just absolutely fell in love with them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, decided I wanted to become a veterinarian. So after I graduated from high school, I contacted Cornell, and, they, and it was the Army. You could, anybody would get in, so mm -hmm. you didn't have to worry about grades and so forth. So they said, you had to go to work on farms and work with large animals. Mm -hmm. So I did that for farms in Vermont and in upstate New York and out on Long Island, dairy farms primarily, and mm -hmm. they had hogs and cows and horses and that kind of thing. And so then I went to school. Uh, at Cornell University, at the Agri it's a grant land grant school, mm -hmm. if you're aware of that. And uh, I was in the agriculture school for a year. And when I turned 18, I went to the draft board in March. I was four, if I have a bad eye. It's got dead cells in the center. Mm -hmm. Through birth, I had a, the doctor told me what it might be, but you know, if I had only that eye, I would be legally blind, even though I can see, because mm -hmm. I don't have the visual acuity and so forth. Right. So uh, anyway, uh, I met a fellow named Bob Davis, and he's the one that put the business of the Merchant Marine into my, my uh, head. Mm -hmm. And I went to Detroit that summer, afterwards the summer of 1944, mm -hmm. and worked in a plant in Detroit, Michigan at uh, Outer Drive and Six Mile Road, and they made the turrets for the ball, ball uh, turrets for the 17s. Yeah. And they, they put them together, and from Ypsilanti, they had a woman, the Women's Flying Corps, mm -hmm. that would fly them over to first again to Newfoundland, then then they landed in Iceland and then England, so mm -hmm. and then they fly them all back. And we made the planes there, and they had a job just for the summer. Okay. My wife. And when the summer was over is when I decided to look into the Merchant Marine, mm -hmm. because I was 4F with the draft board. And the atmosphere was most people really wanted to get, or not most, but many, many people, everybody had somebody they knew or in their family that was in the service in mm -hmm. World War II. It was a big, humongous thing. Right. I remember Pearl Harbor vividly. I remember in 1939 when Hitler marched on Poland. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I even remember a little of the Civil War when I was a young fellow. Mm -hmm. The Spanish uh, Civil War. Yes, the yeah. Spanish Civil War. And so, you know, and the crash in 29, well, I was too young for that. Mm -hmm. I was only, uh, let's see, 26, 29. Yeah, about, about three. Yeah. yeah. And, but that was really hard. The stock market went down 50% one day. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that in history. And so the, the money was really hard mm -hmm. and hard to come by. Know, but you've been following the war all of this time. Oh, yes. Aware of what's going on, and so you were going to get in it. Okay. Remember the Lend-Lease where we lent all the uh, destroyers, mm -hmm. 50 destroyers, to the, to the 
the English Navy and so forth. So when I got into the Merchant Marine, mm -hmm. so I went in there and took seaman training. I met these two fellows, uh, uh, who and the three of us, well, one of them sailed and won that trip with me, and the other did other things. Mm -hmm. But we all stayed at, uh, in touch with each other through the whole thing, and both of them passed away now. So, okay, now, did they send you to Sheepshead Bay for training? Yeah, Sheepshead Bay for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I took the test for Morse code, mm -hmm. and I passed it. It was called the INT, and the same, different, same, different. Mm -hmm. Got faster and faster. Right. And I passed all those tests. They put me in, there was 22 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I got out of there in uh, June of 45. Now, at this time, Roosevelt had died, and the war was over in, in Europe. Europe. Yeah. So my first trip was... Uh, in June of 45. Okay, the one I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. off the record. Can you tell me a little bit about the experience on Hoffman Island? Because you went, you'd go there for radio school. Uh, yes, well, they taught you Morse code and how to type. I never learned to type. Mm -hmm. I got so I could later on do 50, 60 words a minute, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I was very good at the code. And uh, I could get to the point where I'd, later on I could do 35 words a minute. And when it comes too fast, you can't write over 20, 22 words a minute. Mm -hmm. So you, then you type. Mm -hmm. And you never anticipate the word because the ending might be different. <laughs> right. So and you do this all and you learn how to do it. To this day, I still have the Morse code in my head. Mm -hmm. If you have a Honda and you do something wrong and it goes beep, 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 are you familiar with that little thing that goes on a Honda? No. Okay. It's four dots and that's the letter H in Morse code mm -hmm. <laughs> for Honda. <laughs> kind of interesting that they would use that. Okay. Now, someone who had uh, kind of grown up in New York City, uh, what did you do when you got liberty, when you were on Hoffman Island? Did you just go Oh, we visited or? each other's families, mm -hmm. and this one fellow, Arnie Shanker, he's passed away, uh, was social, and I met some of his friends, mm -hmm. and uh, I was less social. I was too young in high school, because when people were eight, like one girl I was sweet on, she was mm -hmm. 18 and going out with college boys. Mm -hmm. So what she did, she put a lipstick uh, kiss in my yearbook and signed her name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's the best that I could do with her. <laughs> right. She was a sweet lady. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you, know, you finish that and you, you get your license. Yes. Uh, and then where did they send you? Well, they sent me down to Baltimore mm -hmm. and I caught the ship and this friend of mine, we went together, Arnie Shaker. And I there met my father who had deserted us and I visited him. And that was kind of a, a difficult experience. Mm -hmm. There was a younger brother he married again, and had a brother and a younger sister. And they were kind of young kids then, see, mm -hmm. so that was a brief thing. And Arnie met them and I met his family. We really got quite tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we stayed that way through the years. Right. Now, what was this a tanker you were on your first ship? It was a tanker called a T-2 mm -hmm. tanker. That was a standard unit, then, right. if you're familiar with that. And where did you go, sail to? Oh, well, we went inland waterways from Baltimore all the way to Paulsboro, New Jersey, which is right close to New York City. Mm -hmm. and they had tank farms all over. We loaded up with aviation fuel. Mm -hmm. And we took off and went all the way across the Atlantic. And there was, so there's 53 crew of whom three were were, uh, were radio operators, yeah, round mm -hmm. the clock, I think it was four on eight, right. four on eight. And uh, then we s sailed across the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and stopped in Port Said, Said, S A I D. And again, we were stuck there, the engine had something, we had stuck for two or three weeks or a week or so. Mm -hmm. So we had time to go ashore, and with the radio operator ashore, well, we had other communication, so we had time to go around them. Mm -hmm. So uh, what did you get to see then? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, one thing, one of the, the fellow who sold the oil, we got acquainted with his son, and he drove around with us, and we go on a native quarter in Port Said, mm -hmm. and people were living in their little houses with their goats. Well, that doesn't fly mm -hmm. in the United States, but there, that's a common thing. Mm -hmm. And it was disappointing. Then as we went through the canal, I saw a man on a camel, and I looked at him, here I am, uh, 18, 19 years old, I guess now, and... Uh, I thought, gee, his lifestyle hasn't changed for these hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of years, driving along on a camel. And we went, we, we went off the ship on something called the Jacob's Ladder. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that phrase? You climb up and down the right. ship. And he and I, Arnie and I, went swimming in the Gulf of Eight. It was like a hot salt bath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got back on the ship, and then we uh, went over to, uh, across the Indian Ocean to what was then Ceylon. We stopped in Colombo, mm -hmm. got orders to go to the south to... Uh, uh, Colombo still is the main mm -hmm. port there, right. and they're, they're in terrible turmoil today, you know, with those uh, uh, insurgents and so mm -hmm. forth. It's internal, they're not enemies of ours, but they're, they're right. it's like a civil war. And so uh, we unloaded our, our uh, fuel, the aviation fuel, onto a British tanker. And when that was done, we went up into the Gulf of, uh, the, the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm. into Abadan, Iran. And right. we stopped there for about two or three weeks, and we went, and we went, 
and they and eventually when the engine was better and they, they filled it all up with with diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I remember there was a crap game going with air flyers and so on. We were officers, so we could have officer uh, mm -hmm. things like we'd go to the officers mess and the drinks and so forth. Right. We saw a crap game on the table with eight or ten different kinds of currency that are floating back mm -hmm. and forth. It was a very unusual kind of experience. That's something that stands out in my mind. And also, I remember a very pretty Red Cross woman they got acquainted with, but you know, they're a distant, they don't fool around with anybody mm -hmm. because but she was a very attractive lady. She came from Iowa, and I forgot her name now. But uh, young lady, you know, they were attractive. Now, uh, did you get to go out and look around at all in Iran, or did you kind of stay kind of at that base? No, port? Just, just from the ship to the air base mm -hmm. and back, and there was no place to go. And sometimes when the wind would blow off the Gulf indoors, the desert coors, like these drip coors you have, mm -hmm. it was unbearable. And the, sometimes it would get so hot going down into the engine room, the railings almost hurt your hand with heat mm -hmm. uh, because it would bake in the sun there. And it was just, you know, it's, it's desert but on the water. You know? mm -hmm. Right. Uh, now, where did you go then from Abadan? Abadan, we went and sailed south out of the Gulf and went further east. And our goal was to go to uh, the Philippines and fuel the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, it was believed, as I understand, I didn't know it then that if you invaded Japan, we could easily have a million uh, casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know it at that time. But anyway, we stopped in uh, Port Darwin, in the northeast corner of Australia, right. refueled, never got ashore. And I was mm -hmm. disappointed. I wanted to see Australia. And we sailed north to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Along the route, and it was in the horse latitudes, the water was like glass. There wasn't a stir of wind. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, when it was a sailing ship, they were in big trouble. Mm -hmm. But we could see our wake go all the way back to right. the horizon when looking behind the ship. So uh, anyway, the captain saw something with his 20 power glass. And he pulled over and changed course and everybody went up on, on the deck to see what was going on. Well, they wanted to show the men that when he turned away, it wasn't a human being. It was a bird sitting on a log way out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. on the ocean. Then he turned back on course. Okay, And they were satisfied. And the rule of the sea is you go out of your way to help. Uh, a sailor mm -hmm. or, or a passenger, whatever it might be. Right. So then we went on to the, we stopped in Manila and I saw a Corregidor, we right, why did you go mm -hmm. through the entrance? I got a plane ride with one of the army, one of these flipper planes and saw all the ships were sunk and taken. Mm -hmm. And the headquarters of the, uh, the commission, the Grand Commissioner had pockmarks all in it and mm -hmm. uh, it was just, they were in dreadful shape. A couple of Japanese soldiers came out of hiding and they just butchered them because mm -hmm. they were so cruel to the uh, Filipinos. And uh, of course it was a, uh, a I guess it was protectorate, wasn't it, at that time? I don't mm -hmm. know what the... Yeah, it was not yet a fully independent country. No, and it wasn't one that we occupied, like, say, like Guam or, mm -hmm. or those others, you say, so yeah. Puerto Rico, it was other territory. So, but we, we had control of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they were, and they used to dine, take dynamite and throw it in there. And when it blew up, it would kill the fish, it would mm -hmm. fish, fish them out. That was one of the old things I remember. And um, I don't know if I should st tell you this, but we went to a hospital, one of our, uh, two of our men had uh, social diseases. Mm -hmm. they, Went to Bordello's. You know. mm -hmm. I was scared of those. And so it was a hospital with a corridor, Quonset Huts going out on each side, mm -hmm. and they had 4,000 patients there mm -hmm. with social diseases. Yeah. And it stunned me. So one was a black fellow, one was a Caucasian, and Arnie and I were there left with one other sailor. And we took a little money and cigarettes and gave it to them. They were very grateful, and then we mm -hmm. left and got on the ship. And, uh, and then we sailed, let's see, oh, that was in, in uh, Manila. Mm -hmm. Then we went up to the Persian Gulf to. to uh, Subic Bay, mm -hmm. and I never could believe the armada of, of uh, vessels of mm -hmm. all kinds for the invasion. And later on I realized that when uh, President Truman said, let's do it, his theory was that see, there's so many of them, and the history was they all fought to the death, and mm -hmm. they, they never gave up. You might catch a few of them, but they all just, it was an honor to die, according to their culture. And yet if you meet Japanese, they don't seem that way. They're mm -hmm. docile, very... Uh, Interesting people, they're bright, mm -hmm. they're industrious, at the lowest levels and the highest, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, it just seemed out of character to me. Uh, you know, I learned a lot of things later on. Right. And so we unloaded our fuel. I remember you could get drinks at the officer's club. You could get um, 10 cents for a can of beer and 20 cents for a mixed drink, which mm -hmm. <laughs> that's pretty inexpensive. Two dollars you could get blotto. Well, I didn't get blotto, mm -hmm. but uh, it was inexpensive, you know, to have a few drinks. All right. Now, uh, where were you at the point when the war ended? In the middle of the Indian Ocean, south of, somewhere south of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. That's in August, when, uh, August mm -hmm. when they dropped the bombs. Right. Okay. And then when did you leave Subic Bay? 
but uh, probably in November. We were first in Manila. They went. Uh, we we also got hitched a ride down. So all the war material, and things, mm -hmm. everything was wrecked. And buildings mm -hmm. were bombed, and it was just horrible. And so we left there, and then we sailed east across the Pacific Ocean from Manila. Or Subic Bay, I forgot where we started. But was the war still on when no. you had gotten to Subic Bay? Or was yeah, the it war was over right when they dropped the bombs, and a couple of days later, mm -hmm. the emperor announced uh, in Japan right. to surrender. Okay, so by the time you got to Subic Bay, the Armada was still there, but oh, there was no invasion. While we were in Manila, we saw a Japanese cruiser come in with four mm -hmm. turrets, two large guns mm -hmm. in each turret. So that's eight big guns, yeah. like eight inch. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, my gosh, if we had seen them back then a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it gave me a start. And they were all lined up in their whites. And I got mm -hmm. the impression then that they were very proud and they maybe lost the battle but not the war. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what ever put that in my head, but when I look back now, my feelings were economically, they beat us to death, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in fact, I'm driving two Japanese cars at home because they said we have a Prius and, and a Camry uh, a hybrid. And we're saving a lot of They assembled ads. them in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're all over. Yeah. And, but we're also, it's cost a lot of money, but it, it's, it's green. We're going green. You know, I put mm -hmm. all the bulbs in, you know, the okay. circular uh, things and so on. All right. Uh, now, so you've gotten there, and it's the end of the war, and then you're, you're heading back then yes. across to the States. Yes, and we stopped at an island, an atoll called Etowetok, and that's mm -hmm. where they blew off the hydrogen bomb, as luck would have it. Mm -hmm. And we put on 25 additional sailors, so we had... Uh, 78 people aboard, but mm -hmm. 25, and now we had 103 people aboard. Right. It's not built for that. Yeah. So we had cots going all in the corridors and what have you, and a black man was there, and I've forgotten his name, and he was a professional chef and some of the most wonderful food he turned out. Mm -hmm. And we sailed all the way then without stopping in Hawaii, and I could get the radio and get it. Now the radios were all open, so mm -hmm. it was free. There was no restriction. And so all the way to the uh, canal. And, uh, and then the crew got off, we passed the hat around, and they all pitched in five or ten or whatever they thought was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And this black fellow took home four hundred dollars in cash. Had he been a cook on a navy ship? Was no, that... I never was. He, no, he, no, he no. Had he been a cook? Oh, on yeah, a navy he was. Ship. He was a cook on a navy. Yeah. And black people didn't have the same status then. You see, they right. did menial things. Right. The Filipinos the same way. Mm -hmm. They did menial jobs. You see. So uh, and things have changed. But anyway, and he was cheerful. You know, he was mm -hmm. a real good, and just worked like a beaver. Mm -hmm. And he turned out the best chow and four hundred bucks mm -hmm. in. Uh, in December of 1945 mm -hmm. was a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when I finished the voyage, my wages, and I got paid well, and, and I had special things on a tanker and special mm -hmm. things for uh, the zones and all this. Right, right. And I took home $1,650 in cash in my pocket. That was mm -hmm. a quarter of what I earned, and he was only on the ship, you know, for a week or so. So that was a, very, uh, that was a nice thing. And then we got off in New Orleans, and I flew home, but we went into a Morrison's cafeteria, and they had black people take trays, they give a quarter, mm -hmm. 50 cents, mm -hmm. and you took all this wonderful food from the serving line and sit on tablecloths that were very civilized. Mm -hmm. And off the ship, you know, New York was all these guys. It was just wonderful. Yeah. So my friend already that. Then we had separate ships mm -hmm. after that. Okay. So what did, ship did you get on next? Uh, it was called, well, well, the first one called the SS Owyhee, O-W-Y-H-E-E. -E. That was mm -hmm. the name of the tanker. Mm -hmm. I never knew what that meant until years later. But there's an Owyhee tribe out in the west, and there's a dam that's mm -hmm. an Owyhee. That was named after the Indians. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got on the Liberty ship on my second voyage, uh, second assignment. Uh, it was called, and I remember the, the call letters were, were the first ship were KVKL. And then I got to the Liberty ship, it was the Frank E. Spencer. Mm -hmm. I don't know who he was. But it was a newer Liberty, and Liberty's had a propensity for breaking in half in the ocean, if you didn't know that, or were you aware of that? Well, I knew that that's what Because they were welded country. rather than yeah. riveted. Mm -hmm. But I was in a, in a later model where they had an, all the decks going up and down, mm -hmm. uh, strips of steel, maybe a little 12 or 18 inches across with four or six rivets, and to hold it together. Mm -hmm. And we went through some terrible storms and we never had any problems. But I was frightened, you know, and the ship was just bouncing around and, oh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, we went out right through the eye of the storm, and this was in the Atlantic. Now, my friend Arnie, 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 uh, Schenker, S C H E N K E R, a very common name in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, he had was on Liberty ship too, so he was coming back from Europe, and I was going to Europe. Mm -hmm. I went three trips and then quit. And we knew each other's call letters. So in the middle of the ocean, I heard us, and I call, called him. You know, the board's mm -hmm. going. And we mm -hmm. went on. There's there's a, there's a radio frequency you you call on, and then mm -hmm. to, to exchange things, you go to a lower frequency mm -hmm. from 500 down, 
and 500 is just below AM stuff mm -hmm. radio, you know, in, F in AM. And so he gets up to New York and he calls my sister and said, we talked to Bud. Mm -hmm. We're just in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. How many people have done that? <laughs> oh, and when I was in, in Panama, I sent a telegram to my mother from the ship mm -hmm. and paid for it um, that I was okay. So when I got home, mm -hmm. she knew I was safe. And she saved that thing, and I still have that piece of paper. <laughs> that's quite interesting. But that's what we did. And then I went to Europe uh, three times to uh, Rotterdam, and oh, it's not Amsterdam, it's Antwerp. Uh, Antwerp, yes, twice. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I sold some cigarettes on the black market and just rolled out and traded them for cash. And mm -hmm. Met a little lady who was a survivor of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I was so stunned by it, I didn't know what to do. I didn't give her any money. And she said, she walked up to me and said in Yiddish, are you a Jewish boy? And I said, yes. Yiddish is a dialect of German. Right. Okay. And it means Yiddishia, you know, which is Judea. That's from mm -hmm. Judea, is mm -hmm. what it is. And that's where I think where the word Jew comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that... Yes, actually, good. Uh, if that's true, but that's my understanding. Yeah. And so there she was. And uh, but later on, I was in Belgium again, and we'd see bombed out buildings and just all kinds of things. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it was a very terrible place. What kinds of things were you taking over Europe? Oh, I, I would only take uh, cigarettes. No, what kinds of cargo did you have? Oh, uh, I forgot the first cargo, but the second cargo, we went to Tampico, Mexico, and loaded up with the drums of asphalt, which was used to build the roads. Mm -hmm. And they were all full of this stuff. And in Tampico, you don't see any tourists. Mm -hmm. And I swam on the beach on the Gulf Current. Would, I'd end up in the water 200 yards up the beach north. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have a picture of myself, you know, in the, oh, I was 20. And uh, they wore, they didn't wear shoes. And they were so happy we gave them American cigarettes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the fellows went crazy on one of those ships. We had too much to drink. And he had mm -hmm. the DTs. He was mm -hmm. out of his war. war. And so they put him ashore in... Uh, in uh, uh, Key West, mm -hmm. and and then they were going with the guns, the, and I had no idea he was violent. You know, I locked myself up. And he was he was he was demented, but he wasn't violent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and then we went on to Europe. So we got on the Gulf Stream, and the, the, the Liberty would only do about twelve knots. But on the Gulf Stream, they picked three or four or five mm -hmm. more, and we'd be close. And they, they followed the temperature of the water they, as far as they could to Europe, then cut off into Europe. So, mm -hmm. so that saved fuel doing that. Right. Coming out of the Gulf on one of the trips, I saw a fin. To me, it looked as high as this, mm -hmm. uh, five feet, like your camera here. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know what kind of a shark it was, but it curdled me just looking at him. Mm -hmm. And he finally did. He was looking for the garbage. It mm -hmm. was smart. Follow the ship. We dump things. And right. You can eat it. And uh, it really was just an awful fin. I'm sitting on the fan tail of the ship there, and here's this big fin going behind us. And it really curdled me. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in the water, and you know about the, uh, what was the cruiser... Uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Yeah. That was a horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, they, all the guys were eaten up by sharks. You know, they had a field day with it. And I didn't know that, of course, until mm -hmm. later. But uh, the sharks just, they turned me off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, in general, how did you like being at sea? It was enjoyable in some respects, but not in others. You know, it was, it was a new kind of experience. Mm -hmm. we, we had a storm come over our Liberty ship, which was not a hurricane, but a very strong mm -hmm. storm. And the eye came over it and it stopped and we went through the storm all over again. Yeah. And they have something in the wheelhouse that hangs when it's plumbed up when the ship is mm -hmm. even. You adjust it. And then it's called an inclinometer. And it's so all in gravity. And when the ship turns, mm -hmm. you see how many degrees it goes either way. See? And if it goes to 28 or 30, it's level rolled over. Mm -hmm. And Captain Mahoney was up there and I thought, what the hell? If, if Mahoney's worried, old Bleacher should be worried too. You know, mm -hmm. that ship was doing this and this. And, we had to eat cold cuts and cheese and crackers because you couldn't bake. Mm -hmm. It would just everything would fall down. You know, right. couldn't cook food. So, but finally we got out of it. But it was just it was blue in the su in the center and the weeds were coming small ones. Somebody go through the whole thing all over mm -hmm. again. And you'd look up at the water three or four stories high. We were in the trough of the water. Was right. up and it was frightening. Mm -hmm. And they say there they used to say in um, World War One there were no atheists in the trenches. Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably there were no atheists. I had a mate there. He was a second mate. On, on, on this Liberty ship, and it, he had scars on his arm for burns. It took him during the hot portion of the war earlier, mm -hmm. three ships to get over. The two were shot out from under him. He was mm -hmm. saved in both instances, and the third ship took him across. And he still went to sea. Mm -hmm. Some people, I guess, they got some of their blood, but it wasn't mine, so I quit in September of uh, '46. And what did you do then when you got out? Well, I looked for jobs. I worked at a Wall Street firm, and I learned a little about the uh, stock market. 
then I went to another firm where I became a clerk and look at the, and kept the commissions on the salesman. That this money because I'm working peanuts and they're making all this money, mm -hmm. so I left that, and I went to work for a bread company called Arnold Bread. Mm -hmm. It's an Eastern bread. Yes, I'm familiar with that. And Paul Arnold used to take out of his car. It used to be at the time they were selling wholesale seventeen million dollars worth of bread from Washington up to Boston mm -hmm. and Byron's, and it's a very fine bread. They had different kinds of they had sweet rolls and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. So the factory you go in there, when we have a meeting for the for the promotional staff, you know, because mm -hmm. that's what I did. And we'd meet all there in, in Port Chester, New York, it was, and where the, uh, near Connecticut. And um, uh, you'd walk out of the, in, into the plant, and the smells, your stomach would do cartwheels because mm -hmm. you're hungry and hear all these marvelous smells. It's like your mother making cake, you know, mm -hmm. it's her pie. So that was an interesting experience, but I learned that. Then later, I um, uh, decided I better get some more education. So I sold my car and, and quit, and I went uh, to school. Uh, at the City College of New York Business School on 23rd on Lexington Avenue, mm -hmm. so if you know that location. And I studied business there. And uh, I, I went, I, I worked and went to school at night. Then I sold my car and I went days. Mm -hmm. And that's what, after that I went in the Army in the summer of, uh, f of, of uh, it was October, the fall of 1950. 50. Right. You Friday, know. October the 13th, 1950. Okay. And were you drafted then? Yeah, I was yeah. taken out of the Army. Mm -hmm. So they, they weren't terribly impressed by the fact that you'd been in the Merchant Marine? Or well, they like realized that. if you have a good eye and you wear glasses, it doesn't make any difference. You mm -hmm. know, the Chinese, I, I saw Japanese soldiers all over wearing glasses. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, and, uh, you know, they're, they're silly about certain things. You know, they make rules. And, right. And uh, I, I learned about also they had ensigns in the Navy who might have blood pressure that was too high. And so mm -hmm. they, they stay up all night when you're tired, your blood pressure drops. They, mm -hmm. And they pass the test and they get as a Navy flyer. Right. <laughs> all right. So, now, um, did you have to go through the regular Army basic training and all yes, of that? Yes, my basic training was at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, which mm -hmm. now has been subdivided. It's all right. over with. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't on a regular thing. It was a, a quartermaster company that was a laundry company. Mm -hmm. now, we didn't do anything with the laundry company, but yeah. that was the thing. Mm -hmm. So and there was a captain I had in, in my uh, outfit. Uh, I've forgotten which company I was mm -hmm. in. But I could type, see. Mm -hmm. They put me in the, the quarterly uh, in the, in the orderly room. Right. The other fellows out in the range while I was typing, and we mm -hmm. had the little cherry red hot stove in there. It was wonderful in the winter, mm -hmm. cold and damp in, in Boston. It was mm -hmm. like here. So. Okay. And right. so uh, anyway, I had a captain by the name of uh, William William K. Hahn, H A H N, mm -hmm. and he said, "Art, you can make it through OCS if you want to go," because I went in World War II and made it in seventy-seven days in the quartermaster corps. He mm -hmm. was a captain now. And he was getting his full pay from Hustler's department store in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And his wife had a good job as a buyer somewhere. And he was getting captain's pay. Mm -hmm. And they drive with a brand new Buick, mm -hmm. nice looking lady, you know. He said, you can do it. So he encouraged me. And mm -hmm. I did that. I applied for and was accepted. So I had to go to Fort, um, the one in uh, New Jersey, right outside of... Uh, Fort Dix? Or Fort yeah, Fort Dix is where I went for... Uh, leadership school and I made some mistakes and I went to a body and looked it up and they said, you know, there was, there was a grenade on the road and blow it off because mm -hmm. you, 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 they would booby trap everything, you know, mm -hmm. the armies. So, uh, but anyway, I got through that and I went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I went through OCS in 22 months and mm -hmm. oh, they run you ragged. You start with 150, you end up with 75. And I got acquainted with a, a young lady and I was married, you know, she was a cute gal and, the, and a PX. And so she came put my bars on. Well, they said one and one makes six, you know, and I mm -hmm. went to the there. But I never said anything, and they assumed that it was even under you married to you. Mm -hmm. That's trouble. <laughs> so, but anyway, she pinned me, and, and what happened, well, we had a phalanx of 144 people, see, mm -hmm. for the, the group that we were in. They pushed them all together for the parade, and one in front, and there were 146 of us, and I asked, who wants to sit with the generals? And I stuck my hand up, so instead of marching in the parade, mm -hmm. I was behind the generals saluting them when it went by, and that's mm -hmm. what I did. And then I uh, finished at Fort Sill, and I went to Fort Bliss and studied anti-aircraft. At that time, they still had artillery that did mm -hmm. machine guns and 40 millimeters mm -hmm. and buffers, and uh, they had 90 millimeter yeah. and 120, you know, right. they would shoot up. And, and the, the missile program was in progress then, but not developed. Mm -hmm. And so from there is when they gave me an assignment to go over to Korea. I went to Korea in September of... 52, maybe? 52, mm -hmm. yes. And I spent three weeks in, uh, uh, oh, it was, it was a former OCS of Japanese. I forget the, the uh, camp number. 
and uh, then they took uh, uh, what was it radiation and poisons and all that and give you training other stuff mm -hmm. and off to Korea I went so but I got on the boat to go from Sasebo over into Pusan mm -hmm. where it had been the Pusan perimeter right and now they had moved forward and right. it was stable on the line mm -hmm. around Panmunjom. I saw all these walking wounded coming on the boat. And I thought, God, here's the old meat and here's the fresh meat. It just mm -hmm. went through my head. And so I got off the ship and found out much later that a lot of them were accidents that happened from it. Burns and mm -hmm. automobiles and all this, yeah. the bad roads and so forth. But about half of them were, they were the walking wounded and some of them mm -hmm. were carried out. Something interesting, one of the physicians on the boat said he was working in one of the hospitals where they had captured a North Korean or Chinese, maybe a Chinese. Mm -hmm. and they had told him, if you get captured, they're going to castrate you. Mm -hmm. So he woke up after he was wounded, and this guy had operated on him. Mm -hmm. They had a whole team. And the first thing he did was grab down at his, at his groin, see? Mm -hmm. When they were still there, he was stunned, see? And, uh, but, so, in other words, they, they propagandized you sure? so that, and that, that was quite interesting. Uh, I, I ended up in the division artillery of the 25th U.S. Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. It was called the 21st AAA Automatic Weapons Battalion Self-Propelled. And my uh, commander was a fellow named Dan Williams. And in, in, in Vietnam, he was the commander of artillery of the whole uh, division mm -hmm. uh, uh, during that war. Okay, so we came back to the mm -hmm. same thing. He was a bird colonel. So he, mm -hmm. he was my big boss. And so I was assigned, and I was uh, in a platoon, assistant platoon commander, and then they moved me back to battalion. Mm -hmm. Somebody liked me, and they put me back there, and I was working for a fellow named uh, um, uh, Al Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-Z. He was mm -hmm. a major, not a West Pointer, and he went back to division and got a job, so they must have thought highly of him, and he'd say, read this, mm -hmm. read this. Mm -hmm. Now this is what they do, and you go to the, uh, and he was educating me as we went mm -hmm. along. And, uh, but I guess he thought I had something, see, and so, and I go around with a chaplain and do different, different things. And mm -hmm. There's a chaplain named Conant, he was a wonderful human being. Um, and we, we could get uh, Japanese beer, uh, Asahi, and, and uh, there was one other one, Asahi. And yeah, Kirin? Hmm? Kirin? No, I can't think of it. Yeah. But it was pretty good beer. Mm -hmm. We get cases of it, see, we'd get, the, the Koreans would put the ice on the ground and, and mm -hmm. keep, if you get ice, you'd get an ice beer in the middle of nowhere, see. Nobody got drunk, usually, mm -hmm. usually. But the first time I was up there at the front line, I took my head out to look around, you know, it's quizzical, mm -hmm. not smart. A bullet went right by my mm -hmm. head, I could hear it go by. It scared me half to death. And much later, when I had a job in, in the government and I was a lawyer, my um, uh, boss was a fellow named Frank Conley. He had been a, a tank commander in World War II. Mm -hmm. A second lieutenant came in from West Point, did the same thing, and got nailed by a German sharpshooter. Mm -hmm. Dropped him, and at night they carried the body off. Right. And I've often wondered, you know, how come he survived and I didn't? And um, you wonder if the master plan, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, you get thoughts like that. So. Now, did an anti-aircraft battery have much to do on the front line? No, not an anti-aircraft. But what we did was these, they, they were quad 50 machine guns mm -hmm. on top of a half track. Right. Okay, you're familiar with them. Yeah, the M16, yeah. Yeah. So what we did is we would make... Uh, stuff to, to fire it with and, and we'd put tape on the mark it all for elevation and deflection. Mm -hmm. And so we would fire it about 7,000 yards, about four miles. And they had a type of incendiary uh, bullet from plane to plane mm -hmm. that would blow up the plane if it got into the tank. Mm -hmm. So if it, hit it, it would sparkle and it would start off. So when it hit the, hit the hard ground in, in the winter or mm -hmm. during the warm weather, because um, I got there in September, so it was mostly winter for me. And by the time July rolled around and the sea thing ceased, it was a morbid. Mm -hmm. that it, you, 25 rounds and it would scatter over everything and mm -hmm. the whole idea was harassment to see. Yeah. So, but one bit, one, and one of the other battalions in one of the other uh, batteries, they don't call them companies, they call them batteries, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, they apparently hit some ammunition that had been brought up there and it was all in one big pile mm -hmm. in the dark and we had things but it weren't developed like later on where you, as you can see at night. Mm -hmm. And so it hit them and things were going off like a fireworks thing, you know, up and down, it must have hurt some people. And because other thing that blew up there wasn't coming our way, the incoming, mm -hmm. see. Well, the people in the infantry took care of these guys mm -hmm. like they were long lost cousins, you know. Yeah. All the beer they wanted, did, they took care of them. So, but and one of the assignments I had, I had a 90 millimeter gun and a crew of about three or four with me, and we, we took the thing out. And it was, it was an anti tank gun, mm -hmm. 90 millimeter uh, shells, which 90 millimeters is what uh, is 
three, three, three and a half inches or so. Yeah. Inches. Anyway, it was it, it was like a bullet that you put into a thirty out six. Mm -hmm. It was fixed round, and mm -hmm. and so what I did is elevated out of the parapet around it, so I get the elevation. Mm -hmm. Then I would go you know ten thousand yards, twelve thousand mm -hmm. yards, you see, and I had it, uh, ten targets with forty rounds. I only worked all night. Mm -hmm. See, I took my hat off. It was January of fifty three by then. Three. And I, I got the, it's called registration. You, you shoot to get something near the target. Now, I wasn't trying to aim at anything like with our mm -hmm. radar artillery, because you know, there's a whole system of right, right. You do a little this, back and forth, and so on. You know, there's a whole technique we're doing. I uh, learned a great deal about it. it it's, it's like physics. It's, when it's in the air, it's free of the earth, and the mm -hmm. earth moves. So you have to shoot to where it's going to be when it lands, mm -hmm. like shooting a duck, you know. And uh, learning all this. So I was just sitting in the neighborhood, so all through the night I would put in these ten locations mm -hmm. where they thought troops would be at crossroads, I'd throw a the ground in. Mm -hmm. So this other, the, uh, there was a young black fellow there named uh, Corporal Wade, I forget his first name, old black, and he worked his tail off. Anyway, I, I got a, a bronze star for meritorious service, but not with a, uh, not with a oak leaf or a leaf on yeah. it, which that would be for combat, mm -hmm. see, because I wasn't facing the troops, I never, never had face to face mm -hmm. with the enemy. Anyway. Uh, that was one of the, and I have a picture of it when the gun went off, my camera was open, I have a picture mm -hmm. of it. If you want me, I can make a picture of it and send it to you if you'd like me to. Yeah, you can add that. Uh, and with the back of the thing to show you where it was and when it was and what place, and, and the burning of the powder exposed the film. It shows the kids standing there mm -hmm. with shell casings there, you know, and all this. And it's a real combat thing. But I wasn't shooting at anybody in particular. Right. The whole I was, it was called uh, harassing and interdicting. Yeah. See, if you know what that is. Yeah. And so I did it all, and then I gave it a little bit. Okay, now how long did you actually spend up at the front as opposed to the battalion headquarters? Oh, uh, probably September, October, November, December, maybe a few months. Mm -hmm. But then Al Chabay got me back there to battalion. He wanted me right. as his assistant in the mm -hmm. office, and he gave me duties. And I used to fly around, and, and we had uh, something called coordinated patrol uh, with the Marines and other Army units in case there was a landing where they could mm -hmm. drop in with parachutes. See, uh, and this Marine officer, he was too bad. I said, well, I said, uh, Colonel, sir, you know, I don't like to pester you, but I'm only doing what my Colonel said, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to coordinate the wheel. He wasn't too interested in us. Because the 1st Marine Division was there with us. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, we have the English, uh, the English Division mm -hmm. was over with us. And one of my troopers uh, burned himself with gasoline. You know, you had the stoves that were M something, 1940s, where they were. Mm -hmm. And he got all of himself and burned himself. So I go in there to see him, and uh, we never saw him again after that. And I went in the hospital there to see him, and they were holding him the wounded. And I saw a fellow come in with a bullet right in the middle of his forehead that came out in, his, in the back of his ear. And, uh, and, and the, the British soldier that I had there that was hauled in, it looked like he had three elbows, and he was blue from shock. And I mm -hmm. perceived that he very likely didn't make it. Because shock will put your whole system down, mm -hmm. and you're gone. And he, he may have lost the arm of it. That would be the best part of it. He may have died. So I saw it and I asked the, asked the corpsman, and it's like dirt on the floor, and there's, you know, nobody invested. They were, it's like walking into the next room, you know, and mm -hmm. they had dirt on the floor and all that. And, but none of this joke stuff like they do with MASH, yeah. you know, it was serious. And so they, uh, he said, well, you don't know until he, he, you'd be perfectly dingered, you're perfectly cold, or anything in between, until you find out what the damage is to the brain. Mm -hmm. Just the kind of thing that uh, Ted Kennedy is going mm -hmm. through right now, mm -hmm. but his is cancer. Yeah. And it's probably irreversible that Blackie is going to die. And one of the experts said Teddy is probably at, at the outside 15 months. And it's uh, 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 inoperable. Yeah. Okay. So Sad. Okay. Um, and then how long then were you on this kind of duty then uh, at the headquarters? Oh, that was the rest of my career. Right, right. Okay. And I also had to go around sometimes when the helicopters weren't bringing in those, their bells, the big bubbles. Mm -hmm. I would fly with those things you know, above the ground and, and go out to the oldies places to see people. Mm -hmm. A rear area defense command, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. see. And my colonel was in charge of it. They threw that at him. And also I had occasion to go with my, my colonel, Dan Williams. He was lieutenant colonel then, mm -hmm. back to the hood cutters in Seoul. So they had the great hall in the university in Seoul. And he had maps of the whole... Mm -hmm. A war, mm -hmm. and it showed red arrows, large, medium, and small coming down yep. from the north, and blue ones going up. Mm -hmm. That was us, which in politics they use it for different yep. but, but anyway, they and so there were teletypes coming in. It was just like in a, uh, a you know, the Associated Press, you know, mm -hmm. boom, 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 mm -hmm. and all the master sergeants there, lieutenant colonels, and so there's a beehive. 
So they sent me into the artillery section, and I looked over there, and one of their guns, they have, we have a 155 Miller, the Russians had a 160. Mm -hmm. And it could reach right where we, our people were. It didn't make me feel too comfy, because mm -hmm. you could see by the, you know, how they do right. that. But they never did. Mm -hmm. Although one night, we, they went by and threw flares up all over us, and we did, couldn't imagine what was happening, and they put them in the wrong place, because we were involved, mm -hmm. and everybody was scared of that. So, uh, but I did that, and then, you know, and they say it's light action, depending on how many people are hurt or killed, mm -hmm. you know, medium and heavy duty. So I thought to myself, hey, if you're the guy who stopped one, it's not light. Mm -hmm. But you have to be very dispassionate when you're a leader and not worry about how many people you lose. Right. You don't want to lose them. But they have ways of doing it, but it's really offhanded, you know. Mm -hmm. And many of the senior officers over there had these musa maids, like a moose they call them, where the young girls, you know, mm -hmm. they were paying them and they stayed with them, see. Mm -hmm. And it, you never docked on the door after six o'clock, you know, unless you uh, were invited in, see? And uh, they were drinking and all that. And in the division, we had 22,000, I don't know, 18, 20,000. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a shortage of people in the front and an overage back in the rear. Okay. That, that kind of ticked me off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, that's the way it is, you know. It's in business that way, you know, uh, nepotism and all this sort of stuff. Now, when all this ended then and you got to go back to the States, then what did you do next? Well, uh, what happened there, they released 20,000 prisoners, mm -hmm. okay? Are you familiar with that thing? They were the, the, the president of, the, of South Korea then was a fellow named Syngman Rhee. Right. He had been educated in the United States, I think mm -hmm. he was a PhD, and he had a Caucasian wife. And he released all these prisoners. And I was worried, because when I left to rotate home in October, I had no weapon, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't tell the Orientals, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a distinction between them, but I'm not sensitive to all that, and I'm aware of that now. But I was without a weapon, I had to turn my weapon in. Mm -hmm. And I had a 45, they, they, maybe I was to take it home. They said, no, you gotta give it back, you know, it's a company property. So, but, but I need a 45 for it, you know. But, I, but after that, I never had weapons in my life, mm -hmm. the whole time. And so, it was October, and we, uh, I finally got out of Seoul. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, these people that they released, it turns out, I was at a gathering in Denver, uh, like some years back, and there was an Oriental fellow and a very charming French woman, uh, young woman, as his uh, date, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they were living in, I don't know. Very charming girl, spoke with a heavy French accent, spoke English very well. He said, you know who those people were? The Chinese communists rounded up all Chiang Kai-shek's men. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones they put in the front line to get rid of them mm -hmm. because they were a source of possible revolt. Mm -hmm. And they were trained soldiers. Right. And so they got rid of them. Mm -hmm. So when the 20, and then I realized when the 20,000 people were out there running around that we captured, these guys gave up, they didn't want to fight. Right. Okay. Uh, that they were, they, they, they were letting us chew them up. And of course, they would have people with weapons behind them. If you didn't go forward, they would shoot them. All right. Now they're going to be expecting us downstairs, um, and so I think our option here yeah. is we Now the rest of my life, uh, I, the summer of, I went to law school at a place called uh, Stetson University. The mm -hmm. law school had moved from the Blind, Florida down to, uh, oh, I keep forgetting the old town. It was right next to St. Petersburg. And I graduated with reasonable grades. I had half C's, half B's, and a couple of A's. One was library science. Mm -hmm. So I had good grades, but you know, uh, C's and B's in law school were pretty good, but I wasn't a genius, you know, I'm mm -hmm. with A students all the way. And then I joined the government and I fell in love with taxes and I got a job before I left school, passed the bar the first time. Mm -hmm. Stayed 17 years with the IRS, became the chief attorney, switched to go through the divorce and all this and switched over to social security and became the administrative law judge and ALJ, you know what those are. Uh, the agency has litigation inside mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. and these ALJs are paid like top rung things. It's like a hundred fifty thousand dollar job now, you know. Mm -hmm. And I uh, stayed with them for all those years, and all together with my uh, oh, and I worked in the post office, and that also accumulated uh, I had for for my social security. But anyway, I paid that in, and and I had a, had a comfortable retirement and and um, health care, but we don't have a lot of money, you know. I mean, I'm a big bucks, but if things hold up and they don't cut our our, our pensions. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay, mm -hmm. but I'm retired now, and I've got a lot of things. I've been a chorus chorister, and I've been to Europe numbers of times, singing in choruses all over mm -hmm. uh, Austria, uh, Russia, uh, the whole thing, all the low, low countries. And that's what we And I was in Spain last summer. That's our last one. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sing anymore. And my wife and I really enjoyed it. She did, it. and mm -hmm. when we got married, it was a second marriage. Very harmonious, very very lovely lady, mm -hmm. bright as hell. She graduated in history with a 4.0, and she was by the hell of a good lawyer. 
mm -hmm. if she had the opportunity, but she ran out of gas and money and you know, people you, you don't necessarily exploit your total talents. That's why I have a theory. If you take a perfect seed and give it the wrong moisture, nutrients and soil and all that, it won't do very well. You take an ordinary piece of uh, kernel of corn and give it every advantage, it will do better than the other one because it has the right environment. See? And that's what wealth does if you have the motivation and you're not a wastrel. And so but I struggled through school and she did also. And so she was a Catholic who left the church and I'm a Jew who was raised as a Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. And we're very spiritual together and I still belong to a temple, but uh, I, I, I'm a religion. I, I don't denigrate it, but it's just not for me. See? Well, you seem to have done a pretty good job of making your own way in the end. Well, yes, I got I got good schools, grades in school, and I married my first wife about last year, and actually my grades improved because I wasn't running around. When drinking, you know, we went out, you know, we'd go out and catch crabs uh, out there in St. Petersburg and, and uh, cook, cook you, know, you, you always have to be alive, but if they're, if they're dead before you put them in, you poison, you know, so you drop them in live, but we had, we cracked crabs and drank beer. I mean, you know, that was pretty good. I was a young guy, you know, so, mm -hmm. so it was fun. Uh, and uh, but it was serious stuff, you know, at work. And uh, I, I was I, I'm not in touch with one fellow that was my roommate the first year. He went off to the University of Florida. Um, uh, but I, I didn't keep up with what the fellows in school. And uh, but I did very well with the government. I had high positions. I had a lot of responsibility. And, and I had these hearings where people go, "Oh, God, all the stuff you ever hear for accidents and diseases mm -hmm. and what have you." And uh, that's uh, uh, beside. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, oh, that's what's wrong with me. I don't you get over that after a while. <laughs> yeah. right. But I had a pretty decent life. Okay. And the last 25 years married to this woman has been a very, very constructive uh, emotionally and uh, financially. We were both frugal, but not penurious. And there's a big difference. One's a penny pincher and one's just careful with money. But we'll blow a little like these things, you know. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to yes, talk to me. Yes, thank you. Right. And what I'll do is if you'll give me your address on your card, I will send you a picture.